where am I being intentional about my discipleship? Because that's the issue. Am I preparing my, my people for what they're going to face in the world? One of them being abortion. And once you lay the groundwork there, you can then start talking about these issues. And um, again, your, your people will understand where you're coming from. Yeah. Well, hello and welcome to this week's episode of About Abortion. I am thrilled to be introducing uh, my old friend and co-worker, Matt Cliff, who is calling all the way from Australia. Matt, thank you so much for dialing in. No problem, Dave. Thank you for having me. It's a privilege. What time is it there where you are? It is, I think it's, one second. Yeah, it's 10 to 7 here. 10 to 7. That is. Yeah. Night night is already falling. Wow. Yes, indeed. (laughs) And uh, we, you you used to live up in uh, in the northwest of England. I used to think that was quite a distance, but you're now several thousand feet um, Mm. beneath me, actually, aren't you? You're under my feet by by, uh, a few thousand miles, probably. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. Yeah, it's it's, it's a long way away, Dave. Trust me, it's a long way away. Well, thanks so much for, for making time. And uh, just just introduce yourself a bit, Matt. T- tell us, so you've you literally just moved to Australia. What are you three weeks in? Yeah, three weeks in. So um, yeah, I was I went to Bible College in London, uh, London School of Theology. I did a BA and I did a uh, master's degree there. And whilst I was down there, I pastored a church as well uh, called Cheney's Baptist Church, which is just outside of Watford. Um, and then whilst I was pastoring, I met my wife, who um, was from Australia. So that was an interesting, um, yeah, it was an interesting for, for our future. And then we had some decisions to make uh, regarding where we we're going to be long term. And then, yeah, Brisbane won. So I'm happy. And uh, that brought me all the way to, to Australia. And we, we made the decision to come last year. Um, and we actually moved, yeah, three weeks ago. So it's all it's all a bit fresh. It's all a bit new. We're excited. It's been a bit overwhelming, as you can imagine. But um, no, God's been good in that process as well for us. Brilliant, brilliant. I I, I see you you've managed to maintain your accent so far. It, it's into yeah. I've on, honestly, Dave. So like when I went down to London, I had to learn to speak slowly, <laughs> and now I feel like I'm going all through that process yeah. again now in Australia. <laughs> So when I'm talking to people, they're just looking at me. I'm thinking, "You have got no idea what I've just said." So it's all good. I've been there before. I'm experienced in this department now. So just smile good. and nod, you know. Smile and that's nod. That's it. That's what. Well, that's what they do to me. So yeah. Great. And you've got a baby on the way. First, first baby. Yeah, first baby on the way. Uh, early February. So we're, yeah, we're super excited about that as well. Huge Praise blessing. God. Wonderful. Yeah, we're praying for you guys. It's great. Now, um, it's. It, for for those who who um, have been listening in on this this podcast uh, thus far, you might have picked up that Matt Cliff is is the guy whose uh, hard work I uh, came in and just plagiarized a couple of weeks ago. Um, looking really at the silence of the church, and, and Matt, you did a it was it was your masters, wasn't it? Looking at right, the yeah. silence yeah, yeah. of well, yeah. To what extent is there a silence in the UK mm. evangelical church when it comes? To abortion so really that's and that was quite pioneering work wasn't it i mean i'm not aware of anyone else having really done that kind mm. of analysis yeah i think what what was you know just just as i mean i'll share what work how i came to that conclusion basically i was um i was looking to do something for my masters um, and then I, I was gonna do it actually on uh, looking at paul's theology or something like that for me I, I was looking to take the real biblical route and then I was in I was in a waitrose one day and uh, just standing in a queue and I just looked to my left um, and I saw uh, an article and it was I mean this this stage as you know must have been about five years ago 2017 whatever it was um, and it talked about Kathy Warwick I think her name was who was on the board of the Royal Midwives Union or something like that I think it's called and she was also on the board of BPAS at the time as well. And I just thought, again, for me, that was like, oh, that's strange. That seems like a, a bit of a conflict of interest there. And what she was trying to do was get, was sign up the, the um, Royal Midwives Association to some yeah. sort of 
thing that that you mm-hmm. and you would know that from that B pass we're doing. And I'll be honest, you know, again, you know, as we talked about, I was notionally pro life. You know what I mean? I would, I would, but I had no. That was it. I just, I, it was a a, a sort of conviction, a, a cognitive cognitive conviction, basically, not a no no action or anything like that towards it. And my first question when I read that article was, um, where's the church on this issue? Mm. That's that's exactly what I, what I thought in Waitrose that day. And to be honest, that's been my heart for the last five years, you know, yeah. and nothing's changed really. I keep, I keep coming back to that question about where is the church, where's the prophetic voice uh, on this issue, specifically in the UK. Obviously, it's a different, whole and different, definitely completely, completely different issue in America, but in the UK, um, there is a silence. I, I, that was my hypothesis, if you like. Mm-hmm. And then my master was trying to sort of prove that. Mm-hmm. Um, and God was good. I mean, I got so many doors opened and through that, obviously got to meet you guys. Um, I got the chance to be blessed. I got the chance to go to the Evangelical Alliance. And essentially what happened was, I found out very quickly that there was hardly any scholarship with regards to UK evangelicals on this issue. That made it a lot, very difficult to do a, a thesis on it. So I needed a conversation partner, uh, um, as it were, and then um, I chose the Evangelical Alliance as my conversation partner and basically did a historical survey of their documents, how, how they've engaged with it. Um, and that led me to sort of, yeah, the figures that I came up with mm. um, in my thesis. So yeah, yeah, it's been a great, it's been an interesting journey. Well, yeah, and, and thank you for, for that work you did there, because I think it's really critical. Um, it's one thing to to just posit that there's a silence uh, or observe it mm-hmm. anecdotally. Um, but what you've done is you've helped to really quantify that that silence um and in particular to place that silence alongside how we respond to other issues and that really brings it into sharp relief doesn't it we're quite happy to talk about Mm. poverty or racism uh climate change uh in recent times COVID-19 I mean you don't get many churches saying oh we shouldn't really mention Mm. COVID-19 you know it's it's a distraction Mm. from the gospel so when you see it laid alongside those other um, issues it really it really is objectively very stark isn't it and that's and, and, and we've mm. kind of gone over that a bit a couple of um, episodes ago we looked at you know your work and also a, a more recent bit of research as well quantifying mm. that silence and mm. uh, and it really is stark um and then and then just uh, uh more recently an episode with ben john just just kind of drilling down on the fact that biblically there really is a mandate to speak this is not an optional extra mm-hmm. it's not something we can just afford to say well okay there's a silence but then you know we're, we're just yeah. here to preach the gospel no there is a, a very clear mandate to speak what mm-hmm. i'd love to explore with you today if it's okay is is really why is there this silence we, we've seen that there is a silence we've seen that there shouldn't be um, why? Why is that? What's, what's kind of, what's the blockage? So, c- can you help us, Matt, just to think through, um, what are those hindrances? Is it in? And I'm thinking particularly here of church leaders, preachers, teachers, because uh, as yeah. we've said many times, yeah, you know, uh, what's the saying? You know, a, a silence in the pulpit leads to. Mm you know uh confusion ignorance well what's the word it's a it's a um, uh, a mist in the pulpit is a fog in the pews or something isn't it it's it, mm-hmm. what happens mm-hmm. in the teaching of a church is so impactful yeah. and so Huge. yeah if people are not getting anything um yeah well, not only is that an example for them to follow uh but actually it leaves that vacuum doesn't it for for, for worldly yeah, yeah. voices to fill so so I'm thinking especially of, of those who are listening in who are pastors, but but also many who are listening in are yeah. members of churches and, and they, they have a deep desire that it really concerns them that their own local church is not engaging this. Can mm. we can we try and help these people, be they leaders or just members of the church? Um, what are the problem points and how can we address them? So so what is it? Is it is it errors of thinking? Is it a heart mm. issue? What's your perspective? 
<laughs> to some extent, they make this. This is the million dollar question, Dave. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And um, ultimately, at this point, it is very theoretical. I mean, I, this is, as you know, I'm doing a PhD in this. Mm. Uh, so leading leading on from my MTH, I'm doing a PhD. So to go back a step, we have the empirical data now. You know, we we have that. That's we have it. That's been. You know, I think that's 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 pretty much solid and been laid down that look that we can confidently say there is a silence with regard to the issue of abortion within the within the contemporary evangelical church and the next question you're asking is the right one why and that's where we want to get to and i think again there is there's many different ideas on why there is a silence and um, now personally um you know, I've shared this with you before. I think I did this talk at Brefos. You know, one of the one of the big areas I think is uh, our view on basically church models, how how we structure our churches in terms of, you know, um, the so for so for example, if we have a seeker sensitive model, you know, I've shared this with you. If we have a seeker sensitive model, which was obviously massively popular. In, in the US and a lot of church in the UK actually inherited that model. Um, and the onus on that model is to become ultimately, is, is it's a great model in terms of how to build a big church. You know, evangelistically, it's it's a great model if that's what you want to do. However, the problem with the seeker sensitive movement is I, I, I really feel it's damaged us from a discipleship point of view. Mm. You know, because if, if your model is to be geared towards um, having people come and feel welcome and feel, which again, we don't want to be negative. We don't want to be against this. Obviously we want that, but also there's more to the calling of a, of a church. There's more to the calling of what a pastor should, the, the vision for, that a pastor should have for a church. And ultimately, yeah, I think that that model has been detrimental to discipleship and Again, if you've got that model, you're not going to want to speak on abortion in your church because it goes completely against what you're trying to achieve. So I think, I think, yeah, around church models, around you know, um, that's one big area. And, and ultimately, again, another area I would say is, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example, Dave. That you know, I spoke to a pastor, um, at a well-known, he's, he's a pastor of a well-known well Baptist church, and he went to a Baptist theological college, and um, he was taught um, that this this sort of model of that you have to belong before you believe. I don't know if you've heard that. So this, mm. this kind of thing. So you've got to understand that a lot of pastors are going to these, these colleges and being taught these things. Right. And he said, he shared, he shared with me privately that for years he was taught that and for years he tried to implement that. The problem was for him that they would never believe so he, he felt, spent all his time just making people feel welcome and belong. And again, how does this affect then our, our teaching on ethics, our teaching on discipleship? It's massive. Mm -hmm. Because if you're trying to get people to belong, you're not going to want to talk on divisive issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'll give you another example. I remember um, when I was at Bible college, I heard um, there was another, I don't, I don't know if it's still popular, another big church that was doing what's called the traffic light system. Have you ever heard of this? So basically what they would do is they would have, um, you know, red, amber and, and green, and they would talk on issues. So you could bring your friend to a green, um, <laughs> a green service and you, you wouldn't want to bring it to a red service again, but this is, it sound it, it, it's, it's nonsense really, but this is what's being taught. And I think, wow. you know, so in one sense, I don't want to throw pastors under the bus. Do you yeah. know what I mean? I want to encourage them because, yeah. I, again, being a pastor, I understand the temptation to yeah. look around and think, wow, their church is flourishing, and my, but I'm preaching, you know, biblical truth, but my church isn't growing. And there's a mm -hmm. temptation there to, to, to sort of, yeah, water down what you're preaching or whatever mm -hmm. it is. But um, mm -hmm. I, th I think as well, I, I'm empathetic towards pastors because I can understand, again, mm -hmm. being one, how difficult it is to talk on issues like this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's really helpful so so not only is there this seeker sensitive kind of um current flowing through the uk church but it's actually expressly taught you know that this is at college mm. people are saying you okay. know don't touch this or 
you know mm. just get people in or belong before you believe and and so people genuinely and and they would probably say in quite a considered way have adopted this as their approach to to ministry i was, I was reminded as you were speaking there of, um, uh, uh, an episode i was involved with uh with a church where uh it was very painful actually because it, we had agreed we were going to teach about abortion and then it sort of started a sort of civil war <laughs> within the leadership mm. and uh you know a couple of them were in favor a couple were really strongly opposed mm. and um and in the end uh you know what had been agreed was sort of decimated and and something still happened but it was nothing compared to what was meant to have happened and what had been agreed anyway during this whole sort of tussle over whether it was even right to do this a very interesting phrase came out from one of from one of the leaders that one of the ones in opposition which was uh, we can't see the mission or value in doing this mm. which is really interesting because uh it it really raises the question of what do we mean by missional whose mission sure. what mission sure, yeah. and yeah. of course what they meant by that they were thinking of mission in terms of getting people in and yes, yeah, certainly seeing them come to Christ, but it was it was a, an approach to mission, which, as you say, was you know avoid mm. offence, seek a sensitive, get them in, and there may well be yeah. a sort of um, some kind of aspiration to address the harder issues one day, you know, somewhere further down the line. The difficulty is, does that day ever come? Yeah, and and, and right? I. The reason I recognise this approach is because you know I've been there myself, and I probably still am there mm. in many ways. I I remember as a sort of teenage slash you know early twenties Christian, that was certainly my default approach to to evangelism mm. was you know I just got to make sure everyone mm. likes me, uh, avoid mm. offence, be everyone's favourite guy, uh, and then they'll you know then they'll listen when yeah. I when I tell them the gospel. The problem is what I uh, uh, and this is I guess Satan's um part to play in that whole equation is what i not only underestimated but didn't think about at all is just how bad it was for my own heart mm. to have a methodology which uh, to evangelism which massages my my pride and my mm. idols you know because it, it's really quite nice <laughs> having an approach whereby you know the critical factor is everyone likes you yeah. you know and and there's yeah. never any conflict or whatever it's it's intoxicating actually because you're yeah, forever you're right. putting off the cost uh for yourself and for those you're seeking to reach and then yeah it becomes very difficult one day to kind of turn that all around and come back again and say actually there's some there's some hard stuff we need to talk about yeah no i think you're right bro i think what's interesting is uh the floor as you're saying is in our missiology hmm. that, that's where it starts you know and um you know, the next question is what what does a successful church look like? Hmm. What does a successful church look like? And if we're, if, for example, if you're looking at the sort of you know the American the the the, the huge mega church model, and what's going to happen is success there looks like if it's big, and if it's relevant. Hmm. Do you understand? Now again, we're not against relevant. We're not against big, but if that's your primary goal which for uh, you know a lot of churches has, has borrowed that model you know it, it's going to look it, it's going to be detrimental to it again um oh, it's, it's going to shape the way we do evangelism put it that way mm. it's going to shape the way we do it so okay we sit around the table guys here's my vision for that, for this church i want it to be big and i want it to be relevant how do we do this and you come to your leaders and they say well we need to do this and one of those issues, are, well, what about discipleship? Mm. Do you know what I mean? What, what, mm. how are we going to, how are we going to uh, fulfill our mandate to be speaking, uh, to grow our believers as well? And uh, sadly, sometimes that gets left behind. Yeah. Um, and and ultimately, at a ground level, this has affected a lot of ethical issues, not just abortion, but a lot of ways we think through ethical issues. Um. So yeah. Yeah. And that, and, and... So yeah, the flip the flaws in missiology, I would say. Yeah, that's really helpful because I think a lot of people wouldn't make that connection. You know, where's the church on abortion? Well, actually, it's to do with sure. where the church is on missiology. It's what, what we think yeah. we're here for, what what the church is about. Sure. Um, yeah. And I do think that this, this seeker sensitivity or whatever we want to call it has actually spread much further 
than the churches who would um, consciously subscribe to it, the ones who would teach each yeah, other's, you know, and so on. I think it's really spread even into some of the very conservative um, reformed churches who, who would certainly not see mm. themselves as seeker sensitive and would probably even warn against such an approach. But in, in, in practice, many of the same um, effects can be observed. So I'm thinking about churches who, for example, on sexuality would certainly hold to a very orthodox position, but they never talk about it. Certainly mm. not from the front. And the reason given is, well, it's a very sensitive issue. You know, um, we wouldn't want people to be distracted from the main thing. You know, they, they, they're not getting anywhere close to changing their actual doctrine on these issues, mm. but they're, they're not wanting to talk about it. And there's a sense of a kind of, you know, um, there's a sort of distaste or even a kind of fatigue when it comes to being countercultural. Um, that it's seen as some somehow combative or kind of nitpicky and you know we just want to keep the main thing the main thing so mm -hmm. i i think even very conservative churches that i'm thinking about yeah um, just just listening to some of the responses again during the whole COVID 19 thing just 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 hearing some responses from within some very conservative churches we're not talking about you know really charismatic sort of you know aspiring to be mega churches kind of thing at all but, you know, a major concern being, you know, what will people think of our response to what's going mm. on? You know, it's it's that kind of what's what's the PR um, element here? And there's a place for that. Certainly, we don't want to bring the gospel into disrepute. But it's just interesting how often I think decisions are filtered through. How is this going to be received? What are people going to think about this? Yeah. Uh, and that again, that can very easily become not just a consideration, which it should be, but it can become the sort of the authoritative filter on what happens and what doesn't. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Again, I, we come back to the earlier point. I don't want to, the seeker sense movement is one element, mm. one element. And, and what you're saying is right. That doesn't, that doesn't mean it's necessarily the case for every single church. And and look, at, we also got to acknowledge that there, there will be some churches that are talking on this issue as well. Do you know what I'm saying? There are, obviously we, we, we would want more, but there are, pastors who are faithfully teaching this and, and, and bless them are trying to walk through their, their congregations through this. I think, I think with the more conservative, maybe reform type churches, there's a few issues, I think, you know, um, you know, John Stott, you know, as you know, in his book, ultimately he said this, that at the end of the day, we can also, have, we can have a pro-life position, but it comes down to courage. Mm. It comes down to courage. Are you, are you going to be courageous enough? To stand up there and talk so that's one issue as well ultimately it's not just a theoretical understanding it's actually putting your will to action and, mm. and standing up there and be willing to do that and that's hard i've done it hard mm. um the other issue is though as well i, I want to be <laughs> again i want to be empathetic with pastors some pastors just may not understand how to how to think this through mm. that's the reality they we mm. think that they they shouldn't have all the answers and they, we, you know, it, it should be easy for them, but ultimately it's sometimes it's, it's not that it's not as easy as we think. Mm. And then, um, you know, they need education as well. That's why Brefos is great. That, that's why it exists. And, um, you know, and, and they need that because oh, they may not be getting that at the Bible colleges. Yeah. They may not be getting that, you know, I mean, we can't presume that they're getting that education there. Mm. And, and also as well, um, yeah, we got. I think they need encouragement, but mm. they've got to also understand. You know, mm. Paul says to Paul says, "I have so many things to tell you, but you cannot bear them." Now, I'll give you an example. It may not be wise for a pastor, for example, to listen to this podcast and speak to his congregation on Sunday about this issue. It may. Do you know what I mean? But ultimately, you as a pastor, you've got to shepherd your people. You've got to mm. get. You've got to find. You've got to acknowledge where they are. Yeah. what they can bear and walk them to where they need to be. Yeah. And right. obviously I'm not saying this is the model, but what I tried to do was before speaking on the issue of abortion is start talking around areas of say, you know, authority of scripture, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. trying to put these foundations in place, theological method, ethical method. How do we think through these, these difficult issues? And then when we come to abortion, it's not such a huge jump for them because yeah. they can logically understand and I think that's what I'd love to 
you know, uh, to encourage pastors to say, look, I understand the conviction to think I need to speak on this issue ASAP. Mm -hmm. And and for some churches, you know, maybe some some churches who are more who 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 have that sort of foundational elements in place, then yeah, you can probably go and speak on that, you know, in a month or put a put an evening put an evening service on or a midweek service or whatever. But for others, they may think actually I need to I need to take a step back, as we're mm -hmm. saying about models, think where am I being intentional about my discipleship? Because that's the issue. Mm -hmm. Am I preparing my my people for what they're going to face in the world? One of them being abortion. And once you lay the groundwork there, you can then start talking about these issues. Yeah. And um, again, your, your people will understand where you're coming from. Yeah. And and Dave as well, I love this. And you, you said, we know this. A lot of people see abortion going against their strategy for evangelism. And I just want to encourage anyone listening that it's a massive, this is a massive evangelistic opportunity. You know, I was just with, um, I was just with a woman in the week who was giving a talk from the state. Uh, I'll tell you a story quickly. She she um, had, wasn't going to church, had an abortion. And um, later on, as we know, 10 years down the line, she, the trauma started to kick in. She she broke down in work, had to go home, was seeking help, went to the doctor. The doctor um, said to her, oh, there's these two psychologists, come and see them. She said, didn't help one bit. But she said there was a pastor that approached her from across the street who had uh, stage four cancer and said he gave up his time of evening, the little time he had left, to shepherd her through this issue. She came to the Lord and now speaking all across the world, 39 countries she's spoken. And I just, again, when I'm listening to that, I think, wow, what an opportunity we've got mm -hmm. for the church, for pastors. What an evangelistic opportunity. Mm -hmm. Because as we know, one in three women are having abortion in state. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge opportunity for pastors. And, and we need to, again, we need to be able to disciple our folks on this and be also be able to equip them to say, you know, when they're in conversation with their friends, their family members or whatever, who may be dealing with the trauma of this issue, because again, it affects more people than we know, hmm. they're able to come alongside them. Do you yeah. know what I mean? So, yeah, 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 100%. I think a lot of people say, and, and no doubt mean, that they want to be relevant, you know, culturally on point. Uh, and sometimes the conclusion they then uh, arrive at is therefore we don't talk about the thorny issues. But actually the, the opposite is the case, isn't it? Because actually when we mm. address this huge issue, which as you say is affecting, you know, one in three women yeah. very directly and affecting a whole load of other people less directly, is, is there a more important issue out there on which to convey the gospel um and mm -hmm. it's, it's a huge evangelistic opportunity huge and and um you know we go out on the streets doing our public education work um we we often find that that starting by talking about abortion actually helps mm -hmm. to to provoke a conversation about the, the gospel because you're you're meeting people where they're at with real life issues yeah. with worldview stuff with you know, life and death, guilt, forgiveness, um, and and there's an opportunity there to to speak of Christ. And I think um, we've we've kind of been trained to think many of us the way to do evangelism is to tiptoe around the the tough subjects. Yeah. But interestingly, sure. Sure. It doesn't seem to be Jesus's approach. And actually, as you've been thinking about, as you've been speaking about um, the you know the, the traffic lights, you know, red, yellow green i was i was thinking what traffic lights would we apply to jesus's public ministry i think it'd be red pretty much the whole time <laughs> you know it's, right. it's you know, don't go right. there no, don't, honestly, you know honestly. don't don't mention money to the rich guy yeah. you know, don't 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 do something on the sabbath in front of the pharisees you know don't yeah. um ask the the woman at the well about her husband you know but but jesus seems to make Dave, a beeline Dave. <laughs> for these. Dave. in evangelism classes across Dave, uh, Jesus would would fail straight away yeah. <laughs> at the moment and that's yeah. the reality yeah do you know what I'm saying yeah so, anyway yeah, yeah it's true it's true but you know he's the master and I think we we very and I speak to myself here we when we're looking to 
how do I build my church? What does an effective church look like? How do we evangelize effectively? Yeah. We so often just kind of bypass the master, you know, and sure. we, we sort of, we look mm -hmm. to modern techniques or whatever, but it's all there. And we see um, Jesus going for the difficult issues um, precisely because he's trying to reach the heart of mm -hmm. the people he's speaking yeah. with, you know, the the rich man cannot uh, come to come to Christ with his love of money still intact. That's got to go, you know. Mm -hmm. the, the woman at the well who's seeking satisfaction in man after man cannot come to Christ and keep that approach to life intact. She's got to choose, mm -hmm. you know, wh mm -hmm. which well is she going to be drinking from? And and you know, I think when pastors and others get a hold of this, it's a really exciting. Thing to realize sure. that yeah. when it comes to real christ-centered mission actually engaging issues like this is a gift and this is going to accelerate mm. Mm. true evangelism and real discipleship sure. and that that ought to sure. excite us and one that and one that he is also intricately involved with you know what i mean he's he wants to reach these women as well and i, I really feel that the church would be would want would rediscover its prophetic voice for a start, but I really believe that that the Lord will bless the church as well, mm. and we'll see. That's the irony, mm. you know what I mean? We'll see the growth that we want to see, mm -hmm. and then, yeah, you know, as, as you're speaking, that I'm just thinking, you know, one one of the one of the questions that used to haunt me, if you like, as a pastor, was not was not, you know, Jesus on that when I meet him face to face, he's not going to say, Matt, did you build a big church? He's not, he's not going to say, how relevant was your church? He's going to ask me, were you faithful? Mm -hmm. And that, and that's the key. And that's, that, all, that's, that often doesn't get the applause. That doesn't get, you know, the recognition from a worldly sense. But again, the, and, and again, I, I'm, I'm not perfect in this area at all, but what I, what we need to be seeking is uh, recognition from our Lord, not mm. from the world. Um, mm. So, mm. Yeah. And I just want to pick up on the other thing you said there about, the sort of the journey of the shepherd you know the the sort of incremental um mm. leading of the flock and and that's something we do see isn't it in scripture you mentioned paul there um we see it mm. in in the way jesus um spoke with his his disciples but actually throughout scripture um you know revelation is gradual it's mm. pro you know, progressive it's incremental and um the reality is that a lot of issues come together in something like abortion. Mm. There's people's attitude towards the media. Do, do they just believe what they read in the media or do they question it? Um, ideas of, of you know, feminism and uh, what it means to be a fulfilled person, that's going to feed into this. Um, you know, whether they consider the medical profession and doctors to be sort of infallible or even sort of... Um, morally authoritative you know all of these things yeah. will need addressing and ultimately before the lord it's going to be in particular that the, the teachers the elders um of a church who stand to account for how they've passed their church and that's and just to be clear for anyone listening you know i'm certainly not presuming to be some church's pastor i mean i'm, I'm not I'm, I'm i'm i've got no, no. authority we're trying to help we're trying to resource yeah. local churches, local pastors in the work, which only they can do actually. And, and sure, we'll, yeah. if invited, we, we come in and we do some teaching and we, we're delighted to serve in that way. But ultimately, before God, it is the local leaders, the pastors who know where their mm. flock's at and, and what's the next step along that journey. And, yeah. and we just want to encourage that. Um, and, and, and certainly from my um, my trips around different churches in the UK, it is, it is very, very clear, very, very quickly, um, mm. which churches are more ready, as it were, for the message, yeah. and which ones aren't. And that's not to say it was wrong to do it. I think you know, it's at the end of the day, there's no, you could say, there's no perfect way to to address these yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. You know, you, you've just got to do it, and then you might find, yeah. okay, right, this has come to the surface. Now we've got to address that. You know, I'm not saying. It was premature and therefore wrong but what i am saying is churches that clearly had been well taught and well discipled 
in the authority of scripture you know in um being comfortable with confronting the culture where we need to and bearing the cost of that persecution you know suffering for christ being actually um a privilege when when these yeah. building blocks are in place addressing something like abortion is pretty easy actually it just kind of mm. it's just another mm. another issue along yeah. the line um yeah. and that's because all that preparatory work has taken place so yeah i just want yeah. to yeah just just to agree with what you said there that it is you know we're not going to be able to solve this all in one we need yeah. to prayerfully wisely um sort of turn up the temperature in a way that is um in a way that that, that brings people with us but again we've got to be wary of you know what scripture says about that the heart is deceitful and no one can understand it it's very easy to that for that approach then to obviously become an excuse and we never get there so you know we've got we've got to yeah. as you say bear in mind our accountability before the lord um but acknowledge that you know every every church has its own uh, strengths and weaknesses and and, and the journey may That's look right. slightly different from church to church yeah and I, you're right mate and i think what what i again for me what i don't want people to come away with is thinking that we don't value evangelism as well mm. you know i want i want to be clear those people who um, you know, those that pastor that I spoke to and, and, and those, these people teaching these things, I, I, again, I do believe that they generally want to see people come to know Jesus Christ. Mm. I just think it's a flawed, yeah. um, it's a flawed perspective. Yeah. So I, I'm not hammering them in any, yeah. single, in any way. I'm just calling them hopefully mm. back to a model, which is more biblical. Yeah. And, you know, and if this comes back to, because sorry, to go into what you're pointing, what you're saying ultimately is look, churches churches that are intentional about discipleship it's easier to speak about abortion ultimately that's what you're saying mm -hmm. and and i totally agree 100 percent um but I, that's where it comes back to i think that we've lost that intentionality with discipleship mm. you know um and just another area and this this is a sticking point for me and i, I don't only get a bit of flack for this but for example, like phone groups, for example, you know, I, when I was a pastor, I had, to, I had to really think through what are we trying to achieve here? You know, what, what's happening here? And, um, you know, cause I felt, I felt like my people weren't getting much discipleship anywhere other than a Sunday morning and, and Sunday morning, you, again, we're aware that there's unbelievers in the midst. So I was seeking a, a, a platform where I could go deeper and that when, when, when my people came on so we used to do something on a Wednesday night called be equipped and when they came they understood that this is going to be deep mm -hmm. do you know what I mean but they mm -hmm. came with that mindset already so mm -hmm. it wasn't a shock to them you know and if they didn't want to come that's fine I have to pass to them then you get what I mean it's not mm -hmm. a problem um but yeah I think that in, being intentional about discipleship is, is, cru is crucial and it's going to be crucial going forward the more we we need to you know that the harder it gets in our culture because you write into what you're saying that it's naive to think that our, our people aren't getting discipled at all. They're getting discipled by the culture. Mm. So it's even harder for us and we need to be even more intentional. You know, we can't assume now they have a Christian um, worldview or a Judeo-Christian foundations. We can't assume that anymore. So we have to be intentional about discipleship. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for saying that. And I think in all of this, there's, there's what's going on you know we, with the flesh you know we've got our battle against the flesh we've got our awesome. battle against the world um you know mm. the, the, the the certainly uk culture but maybe even more than the others i'm not saying it's easy anywhere but british culture is very much you know something's a bit awkward just don't say it i mean yeah. in some parts of the country you're not even allowed to say hello as you walk past someone in the street you know <laughs> so so you know when it comes to something like this it's there's a very strong maybe maybe unspoken but very strong message from yeah. the world don't touch this don't go there um so we're battling against our own flesh we're battling against the world but there's also of course our great adversary um satan who is mm. very very uh wily in his schemes he, he he deceives us for example in thinking you know for the sake of the mission don't touch this um mm. uh but i think quite specifically one thing that satan convinces church leaders in particular um, about is this exaggerated idea 
of just how awful it would be if you did speak about this issue. Mm. I think there's a great deal of mm. fear. There's a real yeah. fear about engaging this issue. And uh, it's been said, isn't it? Fear, what is it? False expectations appearing real, F-E-A-R. Mm. And um, there's a sense that if I address abortion on Sunday, my church will, will almost literally explode. You know, people mm. are going to be... Mm. Um, on the floor people are going to be leaving in droves people are going to be you know arguing and um, and deeply offended and you know it's, mm. it, it's all going to sort of fall apart now the reality is I would say having spoken in, in dozens of churches now the fear beforehand is totally out of proportion with the mm. reality that actually takes place and what mm. happens in the vast majority of cases um, from the vast majority of people in the congregation is just gratitude that it's happened and a sense of that was right. We needed that, um, yeah. including for people who've had abortions. Often that's a, a, a specific fear is, oh, what about those who've had abortions? I don't want to raise this issue and cause further hurt and damage. Actually, it's often yeah. especially those people who come up and say, thank you. I remember one, one lady, she must have been in her 70s or something, had an abortion decades ago. And she came up to me after a preach and said, every 16 year old girl in the country needs to see that, you know, mm. so often it's the very people we're afraid of, of hurting. And again, that's genuine. I, you know, I'm not saying yeah, that's yeah. A, a made up excuse. I think it's a genuine concern, but it's those very yeah. people who are often most grateful and, and certainly most in need of, um, of this, of, of addressing this, you know, so I think, I think. Oh just just noticing those fears and and satan's favorite tactic probably is fear when I mean, it's obviously lies mm. but it's 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 often with with fear mixed in there because fear just if we listen to fear if we allow fear to rule it it makes obedience impossible and yeah and there's a reason isn't there that i think that it, i haven't counted myself but i've heard it claimed and I've, it sounds plausible to me the, the most repeated phrase in the whole of scripture is don't be afraid. Mm. That's right. And I think, you know what, brother, I think you're right. You know, I, I've been with you and people might not know this, but obviously I've been with you and heard you do these talks a few times. And then what I've been in, I've been in the congregation and, and, and these talks when you've spoken and there's been women that have been set free. Do you know what I mean? Or there's, there's been women who, you know, I mean, what? I don't know if you want me to tell this, but I, I remember we were in a church, weren't we? And uh, you spoke and a woman didn't want to come. I don't know if you remember this. And then um, she came and ultimately had to confront, you know, this this trauma that she had very deep inside and he, and she was set free, you know? And, and that's, what, that, that's the goal, isn't it? Do you know what I'm saying? Obviously to educate people and, and to not let this happen, but also to set these women free, mm. who, you know, because that's the trauma. Uh, and that's why it's so sad, you know. My my heart day for this issue is not so much so I can promote a certain political agenda or anything like that. Ultimately, it's to set these captives free. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Because we mm. know the trauma there, and and there's nothing better than that, mm. and there's nothing more rewarding. And I know the the flack I'm sure that you take that makes it worth it. Mm. You know what I mean? Because that's what the Lord wants. Mm. The Lord, you know, the devil wants to keep these people in captivity bondage you know in the in that guilt and shame and that message obviously brings light and it's amazing mm. and that's why again this is what we want to encourage pastors as well because this this type of thing can happen you know we, um and as you know we, we, not, we aren't to be naive we, we know that in our congregations this is happening so yeah yeah and i think just to encourage pastors out there and, and anyone else that you know what we're asking what we're encouraging here is not actually a a burdensome thing it's it's not mm -hmm. you know a trip to the dentist you know you he sort of well i've got to get through this you know actually this is the real stuff this is right. this is gospel ministry this is as I said, setting right. captives free um we were encouraged just the other day someone sent through a photo of a little baby boy um church i went to speak at um about a year ago now and um after the service a lady in the congregation went and shared what she had learned with her friend who was pregnant 
and had had one abortion earlier in her life and was was planning to have an abortion this time around as well but she shared what she picked up from the service and this lady changed her mind and and had the baby and and you know a year down the line mm, we just wow. got sent a picture of this this gorgeous little baby boy and yeah it's it's impossible i think well it's hard to to imagine this side you know on the side of we haven't yet talked about it it's very hard to imagine this positive mm. fruit we're talking about literally lives saved we're talking about you know right. uh, women men who've been burdened by guilt for years even decades set free yeah. you know this is a real joy and what we're advocating here is not that you know to busy pastors who are tr trying to do their mm. what they're called to we're not saying and do this you know alongside mm -hmm. we're actually saying no not don't do this alongside being a pastor don't do this instead of being a pastor do this because you're a pastor because yeah. this is a real gift to try right. to pastoral ministry try right. no that's right bro and i think as well just to add to that i would say you would you would assume that the pastors have got some sort of strategy for evangelism to to, to say look don't see this as something that is outside of that again we go back to it to see the serious issue is something that oh wow this can really contribute and will be a great evangelistic uh opportunity for us because dave look in here so i'm obviously in, in australia at the moment in, in queensland and it's just introduced the most liberal abortion law in the world up to birth and um i can feel a lot of discouragement and i can understand that from from the you know the organization that i'm leading here but ultimately this is also a great opportunity for the church to be the church now mm. do you know what i mean because the, again the cliche the the deeper the darkness the greater the light mm -hmm. and then you know we it's a it's a great opportunity and yeah and I, so i just want to encourage pastors to to again to to think about how can i speak on this issue when can i speak on this issue mm. brilliant well matt thank you so much i've really enjoyed this um this conversation um, and uh, and th those listening, especially church leaders, please do be in touch. You know, if there's any way we can help you, mm. encourage you, if you're looking for resources, speakers, we've got speakers dotted around the UK. Um, we even got one in Australia. So um, do be in touch. We we we, we really mean that. We're, we're we're available, and we just want to be a blessing. We want to serve mm. the local church. Um, and uh, if you've been appreciating these uh please do share them you know share them if your if your church isn't yet speaking about this issue why not pop this in, in, in a note to your to, to, to your pastor or to, to others in your church and and see what happens let's let's try and help churches across the uk to break the silence on this issue and speak out matt is there any 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 parting comments you want to make any any final encouragements any pastors out there or members of churches yeah, I think I think what I would say last thing as well we, we haven't touched on we haven't touched on the people in the pew as well. I think what I, what I would say to you is bear with your pastors, be patient with them, encourage them because I know they will have, you know, they have an issue thrown on their desk probably once once every two days, and um, you know love them again, pray for them and mm. and 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 a way as well to um, if you want to get your pastor to talk on this issue, I would say look invite him for a coffee out or take him for a cup of tea, talk about your heart to him and ask him, you know, have you thought about this issue? Can I, you know, where are you at with this issue? And couldn't, ultimately we, the presumption is that, you know, pastors are know, know everything and, you know, but that's not, not generally the case. And hopefully you, you've got one humble enough to say, here's where I'm at on the issue. Here's my, my, you know, nuances or whatever it may be. And uh, yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Matt. Really appreciate your time uh, with us and um Thanks for having me. In, do uh do share this and um we'll see you next week as we um we're really coming towards the end now of this uh this phase of analysis and very soon we're gonna be focusing much more on equipping. How can we be those mm. effective voices for the voices that we we need to be? So uh stay tuned for that. Thank you so much for listening in. <laughs>